Philip, uh, it is no state secret that you are a panpsychist in your fundamental ontology, but I'm going to ask you to put that on the side, and I'm asking you as a philosopher of mind to look at your perspective of the entire field of consciousness studies, philosophy of mind, over the last uh, 30, 40 years, uh, you know, your professional life, which is less than that. Um, how has it developed and how does it look today? Yeah, I think in terms of the science, we haven't reached a state where there is a lot of consensus. It's fair to say there were great hopes in the 1990s when consciousness science got going in a serious way, because before it was something of a taboo. <laughs> um, there, there were great hopes that it, it would be kind of all wrapped up by now, and, and those hopes sadly have not been realized. One thing I think that's become apparent that, that, I'm, that I think could be more appreciated is that actually how you interpret the scientific data is, is in some way dependent on your philosophical convictions about consciousness. I'm, I'm forgetting the hard problem and all that, <laughs> the, you know, the, the really philosophical issues, but just how you interpret the scientific data itself is influenced by your philosophical commitments. Let me, let me give you an example. It's debated whether you could have an experience you're not aware of. So think about the experience you're having right now, the clothes on your body. Right now I've, now I've drawn your attention to it. You might, yeah. be, you might be thinking about it, but yeah. think about, before I mentioned it, the ex, think about the experience of, of your socks against your feet. Mm -hmm. Were you experiencing that before you were thinking about it? Right. Well, some philosophers say, yeah, of course you are. You just, you're experiencing it. You just weren't aware of the experience. Other philosophers say, no, no, that doesn't make sense. How, how could that be? How could you be experiencing yeah. something and not be aware yeah. of your own experience? Yeah. Yeah. Now, wh which way you go on that influences how you interpret the data. Because those who think you have to be aware of an experience, they're going to think that the, the prefrontal cortex is much more involved in the underpinnings of consciousness because that's where we've got sort of the relevant, more sophisticated forms of cognitive functioning. Whereas those scientists, stroke philosophers, who think, no, you can have experiences you're not aware of, they might just think consciousness is just in the sensory areas, maybe more at the back of the brain. So there is this big debate mm. among scientists whether consciousness, roughly speaking, is in the front <laughs> or the back of the brain. And it's partly dependent on your philosophical commitments. So I've got to, I mean, I think where, where we have to go with this really, I think we need to fragment the field a little bit and move to different research programs that are a combination of science and philosophy that are doing science under certain philosophical commitments and where scientists and philosophers are working together to think about how we conceive of the experiments, how we interpret the data. So I think we just, for a time, just need to fragment the field and see which of those research programs bears fruit. I well, think that's what we're going to do. preaching to the choir, that's what I believe, and I, mm. why I did this landscape of consciousness presenting all these different theories, because I, I, I say, I said overtly, that this is a time to expand our way of thinking, not limited to just a few, because even in physicalism you have uh, uh, the, the thought that there are, you know, two or three major theories and those are the ones, well, you know, they may be, but uh, I would not close it off too, too soon. I'm, I'm, I'm all for an expansion. I mean, there's certain standards of rationality and internal consistency that, you know, you're not going to allow every, every theory in the world, but I think the nature of consciousness should have a pluralistic approach uh, epistemologically, ultimately ontologically, it's, I, I don't I believe in plural, I believe there is some kind of an answer, but I think it may be too early for that. Yeah, I know, I think that's right. And I mean, some, some people have a worry about this, that we need, to, we need consciousness science to be seen as a serious science, because that's why we're not going to get funding <laughs> yeah, otherwise. Yeah. And I understand that worry, but sadly, I think you can't deal with consciousness without doing philosophy. So what we really have to do, and this is a, a more long-term thing, is just get society to take philosophy more seriously. 
Um, and, you know, look, I am optimistic, actually. I, th I think one of the major things which is holding us back at the moment and means in some ways we're not really at first base is people, we're going for a phase of history, I think, where science has been so successful and the technology it's produced is so overwhelming. People think, that's it. It's just experiments, philosophy. We, we've moved on from that. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, we tried to do that in, in the early 20th century with logical positivism. Pretty much everyone agrees that doesn't work mm -hmm. out. So we're stuck with philosophy. We have to do it. I think we will, as a society, get back to a point where we understand we need both science and philosophy. And I'm hopeful we might even get consensus on consciousness when we get to that point. I'm less confident, but OK. <laughs> we'll see. We should take a bet on it. <laughs> 25 years. <laughs> Let's go for it.